Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about organization, finding the system that suits your style. So, um, what does that mean? What does it mean by your style? It's uh, to do with your learning styles. And so, what are the learning styles? Visual processor, auditory processor, or a kinesthetic. So do you know what learning style that you have? It's really important when we're learning things and doing different things, it's important to um, take things in with the style that we have our preference for. Many of us will have maybe a couple of learning styles. Some people will just have one and there may be the odd thing in each of them that we have, but our preference will generally lead us more to one than the others. And so when we're trying to get ourselves organized in our office or in our home or in our business or wherever it is, if we are using a one size fits all system, it may not work for us because it may not speak to our particular style. And so what I want you to um, take away from today is really um, figuring out what your style is and setting up a system that's going to speak to that style and really help you um, get on top of your organization and something that you'll be able to keep up without a great deal of thought and effort. So what is a visual processor? I can recall what I need to do when I've written it down. I need to see the person when they're speaking. Oftentimes when someone is speaking, I want to see the expressions on their face or their body language, or perhaps um, even um, reading their lips. Visual processors generally like things to be quiet when they're working, don't like a lot of distraction. And seeing data displayed in a graph is something that they really like to see. It's vital to understand numerical information much easier when it's in a graph or a pie or something more graphic as opposed to um, numerical numbers, written information. I can remember phone numbers if I can visualize them on a keyboard. So often when you're trying to remember somebody's phone number, you can visualize it, punching it in on the keyboard, and um, then you remember what the number is. You often take copious amounts of notes in a meeting, and you re you can recall what the page of notes looks like before you actually remember what the notes say. So for a visual processor, it's important when you're scheduling programs and scheduling things, your calendars, you wanna see all the appointments at once. You don't wanna just see the appointment that's coming up next. You wanna see the whole day, the whole week, maybe even the whole month. So for you, Things like, you know, a month at a glance uh, calendar is really helpful to you because you can see what the whole picture is of what's coming up. Post-it notes and whiteboards are really good for you. So, um, you know, putting a um, schedule up on the wall with different colored post-it notes or those big whiteboard calendars or writing it out, something that's very visual for you is what you want. Uh, putting it into the calendar on your phone or on your computer isn't really the best way of scheduling for a visual learner. You really want a system that places emphasis on color and sequence. Color-coded folders, different colored labels, um, different textures. Charts, spreadsheets, or diagrams are key for a visual learner. In your closet, you prefer to have only this season's clothes and you like to have a lot of space around them. 
you like to have clothing on open shelves that's preferable to you than having them tucked away in a drawer and closed where you can't see them so out of sight out of mind a visual learner it's really important that they can see things here are some examples of some storage solutions for a visual learner you may not like the colors but it's just an example that you can see where there's you know there's some books and there's boxes and there's bins and there's folders there's colored folders um, a lot of different interest and you could take a system like this and you could um, you know do it in black and white or different textures I have some of these storage units and I have some straw baskets that I use as well as I have some um, colored baskets and some black plastic baskets. So it's really just um, giving you something interesting to look at is more beneficial than if you had a cupboard and you tucked everything away in the cupboard and closed the door. An auditory processor would be someone who prefers to listen to books on tape or likes to read aloud. The more they discuss a problem or a situation with others, the easier it is to find a solution. So talking it out helps to come up with the answer. Attending lectures, all they need to do is, to recall the information is just to listen to the lecture. They are not people that tend to take notes. Um, it's all in their head. And they often remember what was said before they remember who said it. They like to complete a task before starting a new one. And they can carry on a phone conversation even while the train is running through the room. Myself, if there's other noise going on, I can't hear their phone conversation. I need it to be quiet. It's very distracting to me when there's a lot of other noise going on. If they forget how to spell a word, they sound it out and generally the letters come to them. At the grocery store, if they've left their list at home, they can replay it in their head or say it out loud it will help them to remember what was on the list. So auditory learners, it's good to set timers or audio reminders to alert you to meetings or other scheduled events. So having something pop up without a sound isn't the best solution for an auditory learner. You want to have a little ringer or music or something um, to alert them to the meetings or other scheduled events. Very often audio learners will have certain music tones assigned to different contacts in their phone so they know who's calling them um, by the sound of what's playing. It's helpful to carry a recording device with you so when you get an idea, you can record it whenever it comes to you. With today's new smartphones, there's usually a recording device on the smartphone and you can even record into various apps that will transfer it into words. So, um, you know, if that's something helpful to you, you can search out those apps. I believe uh, rev.com is one of these apps that um, will take your recording and put it to words. An audio learner needs to keep their files in some sort of alphabetical order. It will be much easier for them to find things if they're alphabetized as opposed to color coded or numerically put in order or by date or whatever. Alphabetical is much easier for an audio uh, processor. Use a headset for your phone. You'll have better interaction with clients on the phone than you will by email. So auditory processors really like that phone conversation. Email and text are not their preferred method, generally, of communication. And record notes to yourself, then listen back to them. When trying out a new system, it's helpful to talk it over with someone, get feedback, verbalize your intent and your goals for this system and what's your method for implementing it. 
all these details, working them out verbally with someone else is really helpful to someone who's an auditory processor. And also these learners really appreciate having music or background noise. It helps keep them focused on the task at hand. Whereas other type learners really don't like to have the music on in the background. So here are some pictures of things for an auditory processor. So there's your smartphone, a microphone, um, an alphabetized file that you might have and music in the background. So let's talk about now a kinesthetic or a tactile processor. So these are people that um, are hands-on, um, they like to learn by doing, they like touch. Um, when beginning a project, a kinesthetic learner will start by doing instead of planning. They just jump right in and figure it out as they go. And they like to walk around the office when they're stuck or they're needing a break. So if they're trying to come up with an idea of something, they tend to get up and walk around rather than sitting at the computer and trying to figure it out. They can work very effectively in a coffee shop or an airport. They don't need to be at the desk to get things done. Shaking a client's hand really helps them remember their name. And when they meet that person again, if they shake their hand, it will remind them of the person's name quite often. It's that, that tactile touch. A kinesthetic learner will also uh, think more clearly if they exercise prior to work, whereas some people will be worn out after exercising. So it's really important to know how exercise affects you. And they are often very aware of the temperature in the office. So if they're cold or hot or whatever, they're, they're the ones that are really quite aware of that. Often when they pick up an object, their mind will wander to memories that are associated with that object. So it's um, an interesting thing, you know, when they pick up a book or a mug or something, their mind will go to, you know, a memory of that object. So where they got that or who they got it with or something to do with that. So kinesthetic learners need a hands-on process for organizing. They really need to be physically doing something for organizing. A system that involves assembly or a very physical process. An example would be rehousing your DVDs into a binder system. It would solidify your memory of what order they're going into as opposed to simply putting them on a shelf. So someone who's a visual learner could put the DVDs on a shelf in the cases and they would recall where the DVDs are by the picture on the DVD cases. Whereas a kinesthetic learner wouldn't remember that, but by putting them physically, taking them out of the packages and putting them into one of those binder systems would help them to remember the order they went in. It's also easier for them to recall things when there's an association with the action. Therefore, putting things near where they will be used will be more useful, for, excuse me, for a kinesthetic learner than putting them where you should put them. It's kind of interesting when you um, share an office with somebody or live in a house with somebody who is not a kinesthetic learner and you are, um, they don't always appreciate where things are put. It doesn't make as much sense to them where certain things are stored um, because it, they have no association to that. So it's uh, sometimes can be a little tricky. But in your own office, um, put things where it's useful to you. 
Making a large schedule on a whiteboard or with colored post-its that you can physically go to and rearrange or check off or write on the whiteboard, these are things that a kinesthetic learner really would like to do. It's that physical action of going up and um, writing on the board or rearranging it that's helpful to a kinesthetic learner. So here you can see there's the DVDs being rehoused and uh, writing on a big whiteboard and the post-it notes. The whiteboard and the post-it notes would also be helpful to a visual learner because of the colors and the month at a glance, um, more so than um, the actual physical action of doing it. It's how it looks. So let's talk about paperwork. I like to have a three tray system, an inbox, a pending, or a working on file, and then a to file. So everything that comes into my house goes into the inbox. Sometimes things can be dealt with right away. And if they can be dealt with right away in just a few seconds, then I deal with them right away but otherwise they go into the inbox. It's really important that your inbox is not too big of a, of a box because you want to be constantly going through the inbox and dealing with the stuff that's in the inbox. If your box is too big, you could tend to ignore it until it becomes overflowing and that's not a helpful system. Um, and then once you've dealt with it, sometimes things in the inbox can right away go to the, to the to file or they need more work done to them and they go in the pending file. So for myself, I have um, a, like a gift box that I use for my inbox. My pending file is just uh, file folders on my desk and the to file, I have another box to file and I try to Whenever I can, I try to file something as soon as it's finished with the pending box. But um, keeping that system is a simple way to keep your paperwork organized. You can also use a binder with page pockets. So um, years ago, before we had computers and whatnot, I had seven binders and I had page pockets in those binders and I had a binder for each year and I would put all my bills every month into their corresponding pocket and then after seven years I would take the seven the first year and I would shred everything and then that would become my first year again so I always had this revolving seven years set of binders um, now that we have internet and that I use this as Instead of having the binders, I get a lot of my bills online and the ones that I don't get online, I usually scan them so I have them on the computer. And so I have this sort of an online binder with different folders that things go into. In my email, in my um, email, I have a lot of folders for various things and I use it as an inbox kind of a thing. And move things to to the various folders when they're pending and when they get to the point of to file they either get put in the trash or they get saved to a hard drive somewhere when my children were small i also used a binder system for school notes i had a three hole punch I had one of those small three hole punches that actually fits in the binder in the three holes and every time school notes came home field trips phone lists from sports teams whatever it was i would instantly punch three holes in it and put it in the binder it's just a small i don't even think it was a one inch binder it might have been a half inch binder and i kept it in the kitchen cupboard by the calendar oftentimes you fill out the receipt for the field trip and you send it back to school with the kids with the money and then you completely forget what day this field trip was and what were the items that your child needed to bring with them 
So when it's in the binder, you can easily go and look for it. And if you don't want to use a hole punch, if you don't have a hole punch and you don't want to buy one, you can use the page pockets as well. And you can put um, dividers in the binder so you can divide it up by each child or um, one for school, one for dance, one for hockey, whatever it is that makes sense to you. But keeping it all in one place um, is really helpful. Otherwise, you know, you spend a lot of time looking, where's that phone list, you know, with the uh, parents' phone numbers for dance or what have you. Keep a shredder on hand. I have my shredder plugged in, ready to go all the time, and it's right near my inbox. And when I take things out of the inbox, if there's something that has my name or account numbers on it that I don't want to be putting in the recycle, I rip it off and instantly shred it. Um, that way you don't get piles of paper piled up waiting for somebody to shred it. And the recycle bin. So anything that I'm not gonna shred and I don't need anymore goes into the recycle bin, which I keep in my garage. But you could keep it in your office, you could have a bin, just um, you know, make sure that you stay on top of it. And you really have to be disciplined with your paperwork. I think that's really the key, whatever system you use, be disciplined. And if you're going to create a three tray system for your paperwork or a binder system or whatever, I would suggest to you, don't go out and buy a bunch of boxes or containers or dividers. Use what you have. I'm sure you've probably got things in your house. You might have an old shoe box or even a cereal box would work for an inbox. Um, you know, really you can just use whatever you have. And once you start using a system and you find that it's working for you, if you want to upgrade to something pretty, then go ahead and do that then. But to run out and buy something right off the top of it's, if it isn't something that's going to be working for you, it's not um, necessarily something that you should be spending money on until you know that it is something you really can work with. So now let's talk about SOPs. What is an SOP? Standard Operating Procedures gives a clear guideline for handling some aspect of your business. Written instructions that outline and standardize procedures. Things like legal operations, financial operations, customer service, IT, production, HR, orientation for new employees, communication, marketing and sales. Virtually any repeatable task that you have going on in your business, you should have some sort of a guideline that lists all the steps that are um, gonna be taken into account. Things to consider when creating an SOP. Who's responsible for writing, editing, updating, and reviewing the SOP? I'm reminded of a time when I was working and I was basically in charge of the time and attendance system. It was a system for capturing um, the employee's time. They would uh, scan on various work orders associated with the jobs they were doing, the tasks they were doing. And um, it also captured their time from a payroll perspective, um, as well as the production side of things. One day, um, somebody sent me a copy of the SOP for the uh, time and attendance system we were using at the time. And I read it and I was quite astonished at all the things that this system supposedly did. It actually did not do many of the things that were listed in this SOP. And I looked to see who wrote this 
SOP because it was my system that I was responsible for and no one had um, talked to me about it. When I looked at it, it was a manager and a vice president who had signed off on this SOP. Two people who had never even used the SOP or never even used the time and attendance system. And really it was a completely um, poor representation of an SOP. So it's really important when you're creating one that the people who are actually doing the tasks are involved in writing the steps. So what is the task? What is the goal? What are the tools, access, or systems required to complete the task? These are things that would be listed in an SOP. What is the procedure? An SOP can be a very technical, detailed document listing all the different steps it can be as simple as a checklist, step-by-step -step details, key points. It doesn't have to be a big fancy thing. So perhaps you want to create a checklist for your month-end procedures. So this month, when you're doing your month-end procedures, list all the activities that you're doing in the order that you're doing them. And then create a checklist out of that. And you could create one for the whole year with, you could just have 12 columns, one for each month. And then, you know, at some point in time, you could delegate that list to someone else to do and they could work their way through the checklist. In your home, perhaps you have a checklist for um, winterizing your home or um, doing maintenance on your furnace or your hot water tank or things like that. Anything that you are likely to repeat, you can create an SOP for or a checklist. I have a checklist for my first aid kit that I keep in my car and every spring I go through the list and make sure everything's up to date and all the items on the list are in the box. and. Um, I also use my iPhone in my notes app. I have a list of all the things that I bring to the cabin when I go down to the cabin in the summer. And when I get to the cabin, if there's something that I wish that I had brought with me, I add it to my list. When I come home from the cabin, I go through the list and if there's items on the list that I brought with me that I didn't use and I don't really see the need to bring them again, then I remove them from the list. And now, next year when I go to the cabin, I simply just have to pull up my list and I don't have to think about what it is that I'm bringing to the cabin because it's all listed there and I can easily go down the list and ensure that I have all the things. I can't tell you how many times I've gone away with somebody who's forgotten something to sleep in or forgotten their sleeping bag or you know their ice skates so it's just really helpful to have these lists so in your business sops are super important and even in your personal home life you can um, see how helpful these might be as well you can use illustrations, diagrams, pictures, flow charts, hierarchy steps, arrows, stars, or bullets to emphasize key priorities. It doesn't have to be words. So, um, you know, if you're creating something for people that are visual learners, they would appreciate seeing the diagrams, pictures, and flow charts. If you're wanting to know more about creating an SOP, if you want to sign up for a membership to the Inspired Influencers, Jennifer actually has a program in there to writing an SOP and there's an SOP workbook that you can go through with templates um, that you're able to use and um, edit for your business. So that's something that's available to people that belong to the Inspired Influencers um, group. 
So what are some of the things that we can do to get ourselves organized ahead of time? So planning the week ahead. Set some time aside and plan out your strategy for the following week. So either the end of the day on Friday or maybe Saturday morning or Sunday morning or even Sunday night. If you plan out your strategy for the next week, you're much more likely to get things done um, and less likely to be distracted. So really setting some sort of a schedule for what's coming up. And recording all your activities on a weekly worksheet. There's many templates online that you can Google and get a weekly worksheet or you can make something up yourself. Can be, um, you know, an Excel sheet on the computer or you can even do some kind of a handwritten sheet. But basically, when you're planning your week ahead in your business, for example, say you want to make um, four calls every day. So you're going to call four new people every day. So on your weekly worksheet, you're going to record how many calls you make each day and what are the results of those calls. You'll find that you'll accomplish more if you keep track of what you do every day. Those four calls will likely turn into six calls and maybe eight calls. It's kind of a, your subconscious is really keeping you on track and helping you to get more done. Um, in addition to that, over time, after you have kept these recordings, these weekly sheets, you will um, have history. So you'll be able to forecast um, how you're going to do coming up or in the future based on the history of what you've done. Without keeping a recording of all that you're done, it, you're just fishing for information. You don't have any actual um, information to base your projections on. So it's really helpful in that way. It's important that you take time for exercise every day. Even if it's just a short little walk or go outside and get some fresh air. If you spend your whole day sitting at the desk on the computer, it's less productive for you. You'll find that you're more productive if you take a short break and go and do a little bit of exercise. It doesn't have to be, you know, going to the gym or anything like that. It can just be, you know, doing a rock, walk around the block or something simple. And eat and hydrate through the day. I don't know how many of us go through the day and then, you know, realize, oh, I haven't actually eaten lunch today. Um, so it's really important, fill up your water bottle and bring it to your desk with you so that you've always got something to hydrate through the day. And eat the frog. Take on your toughest challenge first thing. The rest of the day will be easy once you get that tough challenge out of the way. If you have never heard of Eat the Frog, you can Google Eat the Frog. It's a cute little video. Um, I think it's Brian Tracy's video, and um, it's really a cute little video, but really it's telling you to um, do the worst first. Um, when my kids were young and we were, you know, there was always things on the dinner plate that they really liked and things that they didn't like so much. And so we had a little saying, um, eat the worst first and save the best for last. So you can use the same concept in your business. And again, be disciplined. Find an accountability partner to help keep you on track. So if you really have a goal that you're trying to accomplish or things that you're wanting to do and you know that you're easily distracted and you're not likely to keep on track with these things, find somebody who you can keep each other accountable. So you can um, talk with or maybe go online and just you know, see 
how you can keep each other on track. When um, you're being accountable for yourself, it's quite easy to come up with excuses why something isn't getting done. But when you have somebody else, you know, pushing your buttons and asking you why you didn't get it done, you're more likely to get it done. What are the top 10 ways to get organized? Purge and pare down. Too much stuff weighs down on our energy. So really, if you don't need something, donate it, get rid of it, do something with it. Start small. Start in one room or one section or with one item. Don't do too much all at once. It's overwhelming. But if you start small and you see the results of what you're doing, it encourages you to move on to something else. Create a place for everything. It's really hard to put things away if they don't have a home. So having a place for everything helps to keep you more organized. And use a logical system. Put things away near where they will be used. Create systems for repeatable tasks. Checklists, routines, repeatable schedules, calendars, SOPs. When my boys were young, I had a 30-day meal calendar for dinners. And I basically, I had one for every quarter, so I had four different ones. But it took me a while to create the calendar of meals, but I would always know what I was making for dinner. I could look at the week ahead and see what I needed to make sure I bought for groceries. And when the month was over, I would just repeat it again. And so I would do that for three months and then I'd pull out my next quarter's calendar. And I used those calendars for over 10 years. Um, there was the odd time that I would um, swap something out, but it really, took a lot of thinking out of the um, mix of the day. I just really found that the time that I spent to create the schedules really helped me for such a long time. And an easy way to create a 30-day schedule is just to get a blank calendar of 30 days or 31 days and every day that you make a meal, write in it what you made. By the end of 30 days, you've got your 30-day schedule. So it's something that you can do as you go. You don't have to sit down and do it all at once. So just really thinking about how you can um, make life simpler and get more organized. It's, um, it's easier to be flexible when you're scheduled and organized than it is when you're not organized. Back up your software and computer storage. Um, do it weekly. Get into a system where you're always backing up your storage. And looking at your desktop on your computer, is it full of all kinds of folders and, and programs and things? You know, clean that up. If there's things you're working on, when I'm working on something, I keep it on my desktop. But when I'm finished working on it, then I move it to a folder in my hard drive. And I back it up on, I have an external hard drive that I back up my documents and things. Um, and, you know, it may seem like it's too much, but it doesn't take a long time to do the backup and your computer will thank you. Um, when it decides not to work properly for you if you have that backup. Financial software. If you're getting a financial system for your business, get one that works on your computer and has an app on your phone. Get one that does budgeting, debt repayment, shows how to save, organize your taxes, see your balance, 
all the systems that you need your system to do. It's really helpful to have it on your phone and your computer. I use Apple products. I have an iPhone and I have a Mac and everything on my iPhone is also on my Mac. And it's so helpful because I can always see no matter where I am, what's going on. When you have a system that's a standalone on your computer, um, you know, if you're a really large company, of course you won't have an app on your phone for that. But if you are a small business owner, it's really helpful to be able to access these things no matter where you are. Okay. Use a calendar or a planning system. So Google Calendar Sheets or Docs, these are um, things that you can share with others. So um, with your Google account, you can create uh, documents and things and you can invite people to um, either just view these things or actually be able to edit these things themselves. So if you're working in a team and you're in different places, you can all update the sheets and the docs um, in real time and everyone else can see it at the same time. Really helpful when you're um, doing things with a team. There's also apps, uh, Evernote, Wonderlist, Trello. These are things, these are apps that people find really helpful for scheduling and uh, booking appointments and things like that. So check those out. The iCalendar can be really helpful. Um, thing with the iCalendar, it syncs with my computer and my phone. Um, or you can use a regular day planner that you write in. So if you're a kinesthetic learner, you probably would appreciate having a day planner where you're physically writing appointments in your planner and notes from where you were and that. So it really doesn't matter what system you use as long as you have a system that works for you that you will use. There's nothing worse than being late for appointments or missing events because you forgot when it was, didn't put it in your calendar, didn't have it written down, or showing up a day ahead, or all kinds of things happen when we aren't organized with our calendars. Set goals and write them down. You're more likely to accomplish a goal if you've written it, it down. And not only writing it down, if you share your goals with others, you're more likely again to get your goals. Clean and organize every day, five, 10, 15, 20 minutes every day, and simplify your cleaning. Put things on trays and in bins and baskets and closed storage so you can simply lift the tray off the table and wipe down the table and put the tray back. Really try to help you. Um, if you spend five to 20 minutes every day cleaning, it doesn't become a huge job on the weekend. Every night before I go to bed, I clean my bathroom. I quickly uh, I have stuff on trays on my counter and I take the tray off and I wipe down the counter and clean out the sink and then I put the tray back. Every once in a while, I'll take all the things off the tray and dust them off. But, you know, my bathroom's always clean because every night I wipe it down. The same with the kitchen. I wipe down the counters every night after I finish cleaning up from dinner. So it's just staying on top of things really helps to um, eliminate the need for a huge cleaning day. Daily priorities. What are the top three tasks that you wanna get done today? Choose the tasks that will have the greatest impact on your success. So if you have eight things to do, what are the top three things that are gonna make the biggest difference in your business or in your family or your household or whatever it is? Prioritize, divide and conquer. 
and focus on one project at a time. Multitasking can be a great thing, but it's really been proven not to be that productive. You could have multiple projects going on at the same time, but spend a set amount of time focused on one of them. And when you're finished that set of time on that project, move on to a different project. So you could work on three projects in one day, just schedule different time periods to work on each of them so that you're completely focused on that one project. So this webinar has been brought to you on behalf of the Inspired Influencers, which is the academy side of Connect Now. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, um, Connect Now Business Network is, um, it's a business network with, uh, they have meetup groups and uh, a lot of them are lunches. They also have other activities going on. So if you're interested in becoming a Connect Now member, it's $197 plus tax per year, per business, per person. It's where you're gonna get connected to other business owners. For that price, you get a listing in the business directory on the CNBN website. You have the ability to attend all the Connect Now meetup groups all over the Lower Mainland. You can attend the Connect Now events at the member price, which is less than the non-member price. There's exclusive promotional and sponsorship opportunities, 20% discounts for printing at Staples Print and Copy, and a trial to the Constant Contact. In addition to that, there is also the Inspired Influencers, um, which is an Academy membership. This is considered a level two. And for a, a limited time, it's on special for $47 per month per person, per business. For the $47 per month, you get all of the things that the Connect Now membership gets. Plus, there are a lot of training um, courses, online courses, templates, worksheets, plans, and resources, and replays of the live Zoom mastermind sessions um, on the website. You also get membership in Story Academy, which is, um, it helps you write a story. So basically there's 12 stories that you can write. All of them are a bit different, different styles of stories, different lengths of time. And they, there's a workbook, well, multiple workbooks that walk you through the steps of writing these stories. There's courses on breakthrough branding, client attraction, for, funnel formulas, the rapid revenue, how to sell hot selling online courses and programs to get new clients and create passive income. There's a blueprint for filling your events and increasing engagements. There's email marketing, meetup mastery, marketing motivator, all kinds of templates and examples and um, really just uh, a lot of uh, really helpful tools for someone in business. If this is something that you're at all interested in, I encourage you to go onto the website and um, check it out. If you have some questions about it, you can contact me and I'm happy to um, give you more information. If you're looking to um, speak to me or connect with me. My business is Kickstart Coaching and Wellness. I help people to connect with themselves so they can live the life they want. I believe that communication is the key to everything and communicating to yourself is the first step. So knowing who you are and what it is you need will help you get to the next step in your life. Um, you can reach me at coachbeth08 at gmail.com or by phone and um, look forward to speaking to you soon. 
And just to remind all of you that these Zoom sessions will be happening every month, the first Tuesday of the month at 6.30. Next month, we'll be talking about time management and procrastination. So hope to see you there. And I hope this has been really helpful and gives you some ideas on how you can get organized.